Hello, everybody. My name is Esmail Matalka, um, uh, and I am a professor of pathology and currently the clinical director of the international activities at the Royal College of the, of the Pathologists. Uh, and I'm also currently the president of Ras Al Khaimah Medical and Health Sciences University at United Arab Emirates. Uh, before that, I was I had I have served for more than 22 years at Georgia University of Science and Technology as a professor of pathology. So it's my great honor and pleasure actually to be with you today and to give this lecture or two about how to approach a liver biopsy. Uh, this is, as you know, I mean, this is a very important, uh, uh, you know, topic and that we need to do from time to time during our clinical practice. So in this lecture, I will try to do, uh, to do my best actually to show you what are the important things that you should be looking for and you should keep in mind while you are entertaining actually any medical liver biopsy. As you know here that indications for liver biopsy in general includes you know different cl clinical and laboratory settings. One of them is abnormal liver function test. Whenever you get these abnormal results during any kind of investigations, either for liver diseases or for other conditions. Fever of unknown origin, recognition of systemic disorders, evaluation of cholestatic disorders, and evaluation of a chronic liver disease. And this would be mainly to confirm the diagnosis of this chronic liver disease and to confirm the diagnosis, and also to do both the grading and the staging of this chronic liver disease. And we'll be talking more about this in the next few slides. Uh, evaluation of the efficacy of therapies for liver diseases sometimes might be needed to see what are the effects and if there is any improvement, improvement uh, in the disease using these medications. Uh, sometimes also, the, uh, the, we might need to get liver biopsies for post-transplant evaluation or evaluation of type and extent of injury uh, caused by, the, uh, by therapeutic drugs. And of course, still we can do liver uh, true cut biopsy to diagnose uh, space occupying lesions or diagnosis of uninvolved liver uh, in uh, tumor cases or in uh, setting of an unexplained hepatomegaly and or mild hepatic, uh, mild, uh, you know, um, jaundice or other conditions. So probably as you know, the lab evaluation of liver disease uh, is mainly done by what's so-called liver function test. LFT, we call it. And there are three categories of these laboratory tests that we do. The first category is these are the tests which actually measure the hepatocyte integrity. And this includes the AST or the SGO2, SGOT, the LT or the SGBT, or the LDH, the lactic dehydrogenase. And there, are, there is another category to uh, test the biliary excretory function, which includes serum bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, gamma glutamyl transbetidase, and also the last category to test for hepatocyte function. And this includes the albumin, prothrombin time, ammonia, and aminobirine breath test or galactose elimination. However, in the routine clinical practice, when you ask or any physician ask for LFT, uh, this uh, include, uh, uh, you know, ALT, AST, serum bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, albumin, and prothrombin time in general. But again, they might widen this category to uh, include all these mentioned uh, tests. 
there are different types of liver specimens. Uh, we, as we said, we can have the liver biopsy, repair cutaneous needle biopsies. Sometimes when the patient has some bleeding diathesis or some bleeding disorders, then they can go for transjugular uh, needle biopsies. Uh, I mean, these transjugular usually they are uh, small ones, and really the width of these biopsies is not really, I mean, sometimes appropriate for some of the diagnosis that we need to do. Uh, of course, which biopsies, which can be done uh, during uh, surgery or during laparoscopic procedures, if there is any focal region, lesion, for example, or for any other conditions. And sometimes uh, there is a need to get some fresh specimens to assess for metabolic defects, defects like copper or iron metabolic diseases. And of course, we have the resection specimens in cases of tumors and in general. And the last one, which is the fine needle aspiration, which has been like, you know, uh, some sort of, um, you know, discussion about this, whether this is, can be appropriate and whether this can be conclusive or not. Still, some centers, they can, they still, they prefer to do it in some situation. And, but in some other centers who don't prefer to do this uh, 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 procedure or to get this type of specimen. The normal uh, histology of the liver is very important to understand, to be able to understand the, um, uh, 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 or to make an appropriate interpretation of any liver biopsy. And as you know, we have the, uh, the lobular model and the acinar model, which is the zone from zones one to two, three. Uh, and also, you know, that we have the portal tracts as one of the main uh, components of the histology of the liver. If you look at it here, you can see that we can have either central vein centered hepatic globule or portal tract centered hepatic globule. Both of them are, these are arbitrary actually sort of uh, uh, histological, uh, you know, uh, divided areas. These are arbitrary based on the imagination of having at least these lobules or acini by whether this is central vein centered or portal tract centered hepatic lobule. So as you can see here, if this is here is a central vein centered, you know, uh, uh, the lobule, then this will be surrounded by these portal tracts with the hexagonal, uh, you know, appearance. So this is the where we have. This is the central, and we call it the, uh, um, you know, uh, cent central lobular area. And this is the periportal area in this context on the, in this model of histology. Whereas in the portal tract, where, where we have the portal tract centered, it's the portal tract is the center of this hepatic lobule. However, in the acini or in the hepatic acinus, we have the portal tract here and then surrounded by these different zones. We call zone one, zone two, and zone three. And I will show just more clarification of this. The importance of this one, that the hepatic acini are really a more kind of ref, you know, reflection of the physiology and the pathophysiology of the liver itself. Because if you just go for this one, as you see here, uh, this is a schematic representation of a liver lobule, as you see, and the center of this is the central vein over here. And the diagram is here illustrating also the acinus, the acini, the different acini. So the portal tracts, as you see here, contains the bile duct, the portal vein, and the hepatic artery. So in general, in, in the physiology of the, uh, you know, of the liver, you, we know that the blood flow, it goes from the hepatic artery to where the central vein, and this blood will be joined 
later, about one third after the portal tract by the blood uh, coming from the portal veins. So this means mixing off the you know, oxygenated blood. So the most oxygenated area in the liver will be in around the portal tracts. This is the most oxygenated area. And the least oxygenated area will be toward the central vein. So conditions where you know, there is uh, some sort of uh, you know, uh, decrease in the blood flow, hypoxia, uh, hypoxia or hypovolemia or other you know, sort of uh, conditions will be mainly affecting the central vein area where the, the oxygen is already reduced and it's, you know, it's sort of poor oxygen the blood which is around that area. So in, in conditions probably which are, uh, you know, drug related things, probably you can find it more again in, uh, in the periportal areas. So you can see here on, on the other side, the bile flow is uh, direction is uh, from the, uh, you know, in the, in the other direction, which goes from uh, the central vein hepatocytes around the hepatocytes going down to the portal tract. So, and you can see here, there are other uh, also uh, components of the liver histology, including the hepatic stellate cells and also the liver sinusoidal endothelium, which, you know, you can see here the endothelium lining the sinusoids and also the cupfer cells, which are also part of the lines of these sinusoids. Sinusoids, will, that's the ones which drain the, uh, uh, the blood. Where are the canaliculi are the, uh, the, the tracts which drain the bile ducts. So this is just a sort of overall, um, a, you know, a quick sort of overview of the histology. And you can see here, so zone one, which is the most oxygenated one, is the one which surrounds the portal tract. As we go toward the terminal hepatic vein, it's become not like zone two and zone three, which are less, less oxygenated because the direction of the blood is from this way, from the portal tract toward the central hepatic vein or terminal hepatic vomule. Now, in the uh, lobular model, uh, we call these are, these are the port portal tracts. Then the area surrounding the portal tracts, we call it periportal areas. And in the area surrounding the uh, central vein, we call it centrilobular, whereas in between, we call it midzonal. In the SNR model, we call this as zone one, then zone two, and then zone three. So this is just to make some more clarification. And this is, again, this is an, uh, you know, real histology with the imagination of these zones. So this is zone one because it's close to the portal tracks. As we go away from portal tracks, become zone two and zone three. So we call these the circulatory zone because it depends on uh, uh, their ap uh, approximately to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the arteries or the uh, portal veins. So again, this is a three-dimensional. You see here the portal tract, including the portal uh, 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 the portal vein as well as the hepatic artery and the bile duct, as you see here. And you can see his, here is uh, the blood that you know through the um, uh, uh, the uh, hepatic artery is joined by the blood, which is also coming from the portal vein, which enters into one third to two, two third down the sinusoids, but mostly in one third. So they mix together this blood between from the hepatic artery and the portal vein to go direct to the terminal hepatic volumes or the central vein. So that's where they mix together and then empty in the central vein. Uh, whereas, as I, I mentioned, 
that the bile is secreted by the hepatocytes and go in the other direction from the hepatocytes in around the zone three or around the central vein down to the uh, to the uh, to the portal uh, tract where the bile duct is there. So again, this is this is all of this just illustration, just to make it much easier for understanding. And you can see here the terminal vein. So this is the centrilobular, midzonal, and periportal, as we just mentioned here. And here the portal tracts where you have in green. These are the different zones: zone one, zone two, zone three. So this shows the relationship between zone, the uh, acinar and lobular models. Again, this is more illustration of this. And this will show the relation between the zones and the uh, acinar and lobular models. Uh, another important, uh, as we said, is the portal tract and surrounding this portal tracts, which can contain some inflammatory cells. I mean, sometimes very few, there is a limiting, limiting the bleach. And this limiting bleed is, you know, defining the area of the portal tract and separate between it, between the portal tract and the uh, parenchyma, the hepatocytes as well. Uh, and this is the central vein and the central vein itself uh, is uh, also surrounded by, you know, uh, some sort of collagens which surround the central vein. And you can see here, the normal cell plate is one to two cell thickness in this one. Okay. So here, another important thing are the sinusoids. sinusoids. The sinusoids normally, uh, you know, cannot be visible like this, but they become visi visible when there is any kind of underlying pathology here, and they can become congested and here and engorged. In these ones, it's always good to look at these sinusoids if they are visible and you can see they are you know, dilated. And in the sinusoids, as you see, you can see the red blood cells and some of them are sickled. So this is actually a sickle cell anemia, uh, which appears here in, in, in a liver biopsy. Just an example to show you that you should be looking you know, for all kind of uh, you know, components that you'll be able to look at the uh, uh, to look at, uh, at at the liver biopsy. So the portal triads or tracts contain bile that small hepatic artery and a portal vein branch, which is surrounded by type one and three collagen. The central vein, which is the tributary of hepatic vein with the blood to hepatic parenchyma flowing from the portal triads to the, to the uh, central veins, as we just mentioned, and you can see here, on the right side of this, this slide. So for normal histology, again, there are some age-related differences. Uh, I mean, the portal tracts are rather inconceptuous in neonates, so probably you will not be seeing them as well-developed portal tracts sometimes, especially in, in, in the early neonate, neonatal period. Uh, the pearls, and ocean stains, pairs the stain that used for iron and ocean for copper are often positive in neonates and infants, which is, again, this is age-related and normal variation. In children, we can get two or more cell thickness or cell thick liver plates in children. And nuclear vacuolation also can happen in children and adolescents. And also we can get a nuclear pleomorphism and binucleation in the elderly and arteriosclerosis and lipofuscin acclimation in the elderly is again part of the normal variation for this. So here, just a comparison between um, uh, of liver parenchyma of a child uh, on the left here and an adult on the right. So in the children, the hepatocytes are arranged less regularly without a distinct radial arrangement and in two cell thick plates. In adults, the hepatocytes are normally one cell thick thickness and show a more regular radial arrangement around the terminal hepatic venule. 
Here you can see some sort of dark staining and thickening of the hepatocytes. Hepatocyte codes uh, 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 indicate hepatocyte regeneration in adults. I, I mean, I'm presenting all of these just to be aware of these kind of variations that you can see in different liver biopsies. So we come back now dealing with the liver biopsy. So before you know dealing or looking at the liver biopsy, clinical information is very important. So we need to know the age and sex again, which is very important. Also to know what are the sort of expected normal variation regarding age and insects, whether this is related to some of the diseases. You need to know more about the symptoms and the duration, whether there is jaundice, jaundice, malabsorption, abdominal pain, pruritus, bleeding tendency, hematemesis. If there is uh, alcohol, uh, history of alcohol intake, if applicable, results of biochemical investigations like uh, liver function tests, coagulation screen or alpha fetal protein, you know, label, etc. other kinds. Serum tests for autoantibodies and antiviral antibodies, history of a previous liver disease, and drug history, which is really very important and sometimes can be missed in the history. Because, I mean, currently we, I mean, see, we encounter, encounter some quite significant number of the pathology that we see in the liver is related to drugs. So drug history is very important, and it's very important when we have mixed patterns of injury, this might be related to drug history. Uh, again, radiological findings, uh, especially in, you know, in tumors and the space occupying lesions, or if there is any obstruction is very important. And family history of inborn errors of metabolism if we are dealing with metabolic diseases, again, very important. Types of specimen, we have just mentioned this, we can have biopsies for diffuse parenchymal disease, biopsies to investigate focal lesions on imaging, or biopsies following organ transplantation or hepatic exogen uh, specimens. Uh, again, uh, we can, uh, for biopsies for diffuse parenchymal disease, this can be for inflammatory conditions or to assess uh, viral uh, hepatitis, if there is you know, evidence of viral hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, biliary tract disease, alcohol-induced liver disease, and of course, drug-induced damage. Metabolic conditions like glycogen storage disease or other storage diseases, also to assess the cirrhosis and the degree of fibrosis. And the HIV patients in HIV patients uh, uh, where we, the liver biopsy can be very helpful to assess for infections or lymphomas or Kabuzi sarcomas or other HIV-related conditions. Now for focal lesions on imaging, so biopsies can be helpful uh, to assess for types of neoplasm, including adenomas, hemangiomas, hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinomas, and others, of course. And for cysts, for malformations like focal nodular hyperplasia, mesenchymal hamartoma or metastatic neoplasm. So adequacy of the biopsies is, is again is very important. We need to know what are the criteria of adequacy for these biopsies. The optimum size is 1.0 centimeter and 16 gauge, the width of the biopsy. The average liver biopsy cons consists of one, you know, of uh, out of 50,000 of total hepatic mass. You should keep this in mind that <clears throat> with this figure, this means that the liver biopsy sometimes, it might be, of course, representative of the disease if this is generalized for encarmal disease, but also it can, can be not really representative of this because you are getting only like one out of 50,000 of the total mass of the liver itself. The size might limits, limits one's ability to answer specific clinical questions, depending on the what you are doing. And the sample size can affect accuracy of histologic assessment as well. So a small amount of tissue sometimes still can confirm or exclude a diagnosis of diffuse process, such as acute hepatitis. Uh, sometimes even one portal tract present in the specimen 
may be enough to suggest large bile duct obstruction, for example. But however, in general, we need to have usually more sort of good representative and adequate sample to actually proceed with our uh, assessment for the, uh, with the, with the liver biopsy. Again, um, macronodular cirrhosis versus other causes of hyperplastic uh, uh, parenchymal nodules is, for example, impossible on biopsies of 1.5 millimeter width or wide, because we know the definition of a hyperplastic or a macro, sorry, macronodular uh, nodule is a nodule which is uh, more than two millimeters. So those biopsies with this small width, they might limit our ability actually to establish the diagnosis uh, with confidence on these types of biopsies. So we need at least six to eight complete portal tracts for appropriate interpretation and for appropriate diagnosis. So uh, this includes complete circumference uh, uh, of these portal tracts, which contains at least two portal structures and minimum portal tracts to diagnose ductopenia, for example, is four portal tracts. Total number of portal tracts which are available for assessment in the liver biopsy is a key factor in adequacy of biopsy. Now, uh, in chronic hepatitis grading and staging biopsies, uh, a minimum criteria uh, uh, to have more than 20 to 25 millimeter long and to have more than 11 complete portal tracts, for example, as suggested by some of these grading staging you know, uh, systems to have a, a very accurate and appropriate assessment for uh, grading and staging. Now, sometimes you get superficial biopsies, which includes the capsule and the subcapsular tissues, which usually mainly you get these uh, uh, during a laparoscopic procedure for cholecystectomy and the surgeon you know, has encountered an abnormal looking liver tissue. So they will take like a wedge biopsy and they will send it for the pathology lab. Uh, you should be very cautious about this because as you see here, when you have the capsule, I mean, the one of the normal variations that there are some extension of the fibrous tissue from the capsule down into the parenchyma. So if you uh, like uh, getting a small tissue of this, you might get the impression that there is some si there is fibrosis uh, or an ongoing cirrhosis, which might be, be very uh, misleading for the for this. So you should pay attention and be very cautious about the subcapsular tissues. So this is the important message. Uh, however. I mean, in approaching a liver biopsy, you know, you should adopt like a systematic and simplified approach, uh, you know, in your mind where you can, you know, like approach any kind of, uh, you know, types of liver biopsies. Uh, I have put these uh, kind of steps about, I think, seven or eight steps that you should keep in mind all the time, which include scanning, scanning and assessing the basic underlying pathological process without clinical history. So this will give you always, although the history is just beside you on the request form or on, the, on your computer, always try to attempt to do this kind of scanning and try to make, uh, you know, to what, what is the major pathology or the major pattern of injury in the liver before knowing an, uh, any history. This will give you a chance of a non-biased opinion before going into more detailed uh, history along uh, with the examination of the biopsy along with the history. So after that, you can, of course, you know, uh, get your sort of overall assessment and then uh, you proceed to examine the liver architecture to see if there is uh, the degree of the fibrosis, whether this is a fibrosis portal tract, fibrosis bridging, fibrosing, et cetera, and then examine the portal tracts. If there is inflammation, abnormal things, if there is interface hepatitis, the, if, if they are present, uh, their numbers, et cetera, we will be explaining this. 
and then examine the periportal or portal parenchymal interface, the area between the portal tracts and the adjacent parenchyma. And then you can go to the to examine the hepatic veins, the other components on the other side, and then you go to look in between, which is the acini or the parenchymal uh, uh, cells or the hepatocytes. Then after that, uh, you can establish a basic pattern of injury, which has mainly affected the liver. And then on the basis of that, the, you need to make the proper diagnosis or differential diagnosis always after proper clinical pathological correlation. I mean, in, 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 in interpretation uh, of liver biopsies, you always need the clinical input to make your either final diagnosis or your differential diagnosis. And it is always preferable if you can do this, is just to sit down with your hepatologist, either during MDT meetings, or even in a casual way discussing these liver biopsies and get the more clinical information and correlate what you have of uh, you know, injury, kind of injury with the clinical uh, information that you have. So in general, we have like seven patterns of injury, basic patterns of injury, which affect the liver biopsies or the liver parenchyma. The pattern one, which is the portal cellular infiltrate, where mainly the pathology is the presence of inflammatory cells within the portal tracts. We call these the blue portal tracts that your eyes will catch even on scanning, the rubber scanning of the biopsy. The second pattern is the ductular reaction, which usually the bilious portal tract, which might indicate that there's something in the biliary system, when you see this prominent ductular reaction or ductular proliferation, the lobular injury pattern three, which we call the distressed lobule, and then pattern four, which is the steatosis, the bubbly liver, where you see you know fatty changes in the hepatocytes. Pattern five is near normal appearance, which means you call it calm but not quite. And I'm quoting this from this reference, which is. Uh, you know, the very good book, actually, the Practical Hepatic Pathology Diagnostic Approach is here, the second edition. And pattern seven, which is the fibrosis, where the liver, which appears like a scarred one. And the pattern seven is the mass lesion. Okay. However, you should keep in mind that you are not going to have a single pattern. I mean, sometimes you have like one or, or two of these patterns which are related to a specific disease. But when you have kind of sort of mixed patterns of these, this should alert you also to think always of a drug-induced injury to the liver itself. So if we move now to go, you know, uh, uh, for each of these steps in exa of examining the liver. So the first one we said, you do the scanning and bias, you know, sort of judgment on the overall, whatever it is, I mean, the pathology, and then examine the liver architecture. So what you, what you need to look at, you need to look at whether uh, the liver uh, appears normal or distorted liver in general, whether it's keeping its architecture or the whole overall architecture is disturbed or distorted. So in these cases where the, uh, again, you know, h and is, is, is can be useful, but also the special stains like reticulin stain can be very useful where you see collapse of reticulin or you see, see prominent fibrosis actually by HND. You should look for the presence or absence of, absence of nodular, nodular regenerative activity. Now, if there is any fibrosis, so you need to assess the fibrosis and to make the staging of fibrosis. You need to see whether the fibrosis is enough uh, to call it cir cirrhosis, or uh, if it is just short of cirrhosis. And then, of course, you need to use the reticulin, trichrome, and or, and, or van Giesen, which are very useful uh, uh, in assessment for the liver architecture, as well as the ocean stain for fibers, which also can be helpful in this context. So here, just to show you 
uh, examples to assess the extent or stage of fibrosis. You look at the HND, this is the HND. This is the Mason trichrome, which stains the you know, uh, fibrous, the, uh, the fibrous uh, fibers, the fibers, the fibrosis, and highlights by this greenish light color, greenish bluish color. And of course, this is the reticulin stain. And both of these are very helpful actually to highlight the uh, degree of fibrosis. How to assess architecture? So you need to, to see the vascular relationship of portally tracts and terminal hepatic venules whether they, they, they are grossly distorted in cirrhosis or if they can, uh, can be crowded after severe hepatocyte injury. You know, if you have severe hepatitis, for example, viral hepatitis or acute hepatitis, sometimes this severe hepatitis will lead to collapse of the hepatocytes. So there will be some sort of approximation between the terminal hepatic venules and the portal tracts. And this will, will look like that, they're very close, but actually this is because the parenchyma in between that has been collapsed completely in severe cases. You should be looking also for absent portal tracts in, hepato, uh, in hepatocellular neoplasm, uh, for example, in adenoma or hepatocellular carcinomas. Again, the extent of fibrosis, you need to see whether this fibrosis or fibrous bands are broad or extensive bands in cirrhosis, sometimes you get fine septi in post necrotic uh, scarring and some biliary tract disease. And also the distribution of fibrosis, whether these fibrous bridging or the, between, is port, between portal or central veins, we call it portocentral or portoportal, which is between two portal tracts. And usually this is more predominant pattern in biliary diseases or around terminal hepatic venules in alcoholic liver disease, which is mainly perivenular fibrosis or periciliar fibrosis, and which can also occur in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or what we call it NASH or in other fatty diseases. So the pattern of fibrosis and the extent of fibrosis is very important in the assessment. As you see here, this is a normal liver, and this is just a cartoon to show that there is no fibrosis. Here, where we started to have some portal fibrosis with expansion of the portal tract by this fibrous tissue. And then when this progresses further, this will lead to bridging fibrosis. So the fibrous band will extend between the portal tract, for example, to the uh, to the veins or between the portal portal or you know like uh, you know the, the portal central ones so you and then eventually when they form complete nodules this is the stage of fibrosis or the established fire fibrosis again collapse of reticulin and parenchymal cell loss can be focal or confluent or can be bridging or ban asinar and you have to be, um, again, attention to these patterns of collapse in the hepatocytes or in the parenchymal cells. And sometimes we can describe that there was so-called the bridging necrosis, and this can be the form of centrocentral, portoportal, or portocentral. Severity of distortion can be mild, moderate, or severe, of course, depending on the extent of the damage and the necrosis happening in the liver. Now, the features which suggest cirrhosis include presence of distorted nodules of parenchyma, irregularly arranged hyperplastic plates and fine irregular fibrous septi, and of course, incomplete nodules and septi in the developing uh, cirrhosis. So you have, again, to examine this thoroughly. And if you are getting, as we said, the true cut biopsy, although the, uh, I mean, uh, cirrhosis is regarding is a generalized, but it can be focal actually. You might get a biopsy, which not really representative of the overall degree of fibrosis in the liver itself. So if you are in doubt, you should correlate this with the radiological findings. Now they have also the fibro scans, and then you have to do, the, to do this accordingly, whether this is really representative or not representative. Now, the third step is to examine the portal tracts 
And you need to see are the three principal components are present or not. Uh, if there is any expansion by fibrosis edema or by cellular infiltrates, which means you know lymphocytes, cystocytes, you know infiltrate plasma cells, eosinophils, proportion of portal tracts affected, and then the type of inflammatory infiltrate and the severity, whether the inflammation within the portal tract is mild, moderate, severe, and what are the components of the inflammatory cells? Because again, there are some clues. For example, if you find plasma cells, this might be a clue for autoimmune hepatitis. If you find isolated cells, this might be a clue for uh, drug-induced hepatitis, for example. So this is very important to know. So again, the distribution of inflammatory infiltrate, you need to look for if there is any granulomas centered on bile ducts in primary biliary cirrhosis, which is a rather characteristic and pathognomic uh, lesion of primary biliary cirrhosis. Neutrophils in bile ducts, epithelium, and lumina in ascending cholangitis. Lymphoid follicles, for example, in proximity to bile ducts in uh, uh, chronic hepatitis C also, which you can see there. Then you need to see the relative number of bile ducts. So if there is loss of small interlobular ducts in early primary biliary cirrhosis, if you, which, which we mean by uh, ductopenia, if there is any decrease or damage to the bile ducts, uh, you need to see uh, you know, an accompanied uh, arteriols, which means that there is decrease and loss. And of course, uh, these bile ducts might proliferate in biliary tract disease because if there is any kind of obstruction, the bile ducts or the, will try to compensate for this uh, obstruction, so they will start have some sort of ductular proliferation. The appearance of bile ducts is important uh, also. Uh, you need to see the distortion of the outline of bile ducts. Uh, this includes the onion skin lesions in the primary sclerosing a cholangitis, a dysplasia, or neoplasia of the epithelium in cases of malignancies, and also the presence of bile plugs within these bile ducts. So this is a, a, an example of ductular reaction or ductular proliferation. As you see, these are uh, the cross sections of the ducts here within a portal tract. But at the periphery of the portal tract, you can see the ductular proliferation or the ductules or ductular reaction, which indicates some forms of cholestatic phenomena or biliary underlying biliary disease. Now, looking at the portal tracts to examine the portal tracts, again, you need to see the appearance of the vessels. If there is any evidence of vascular vasculitis, sometimes you might identify evidence of amyloidosis uh, in these blood vessels or sclerosis, of course. Uh, presence of organisms, something that also you should keep in mind, CMV inclusions in the bile duct epithelium and vascular endothelium, also sometimes the schistosoma uh, uh, ova in bilharchiasis, you can identify these uh, ova uh, within the portal tracts. Number four, then examining the periportal or portal parenchymal interface. So this is what we call it, interface hepatitis. So this, you know, interface hepatitis is where you have like the spillover of the inflammatory cells from the portal tracts into the adjacent parenchyma, and where the inflammatory cells is, is, is starting to eating up these hepatocytes or damaging the hepatocytes. And in the past, this used to be called as piecemeal necrosis, you know, now we call it interface hepatitis. So this occur in a chronic hepatitis and occasionally in acute viral hepatitis. Uh, also, this is accompanied with rosetting of hepatocytes in autoimmune hepatitis. And you need, again, to assess the amount of necrosis and inflammation and to grade also this degree or degrade the interface hepatitis into mild, moderate, and severe uh, interface hepatitis. Here you see what we uh, mean by interface, and you can see the spillover of the inflammatory cells into the adjacent hepatocytes and parenchyma start eating up these hepatocytes, and you know the uh, these hepatocytes like will become like uh, you know 
uh, apoptotic or necrotic or eaten up by these uh, inflammatory cells. So this kind of um, interface hepatitis, as we said, can be graded into mild where there is a focal sort of interface hepatitis, or it can be moderate where there's like half of the uh, portal tracts, there is a kind of interface hepatitis in the adjacent or marked when this is involving the sort of the full circumferential uh, of the portal tract. So this can be also graded, uh, you know, into this way. Now, grading of the parenchymal injury. Now, within the parenchyma, where, where we have some necrosis, uh, which means spotty necrosis, we call it, where we have uh, damage of the hepatocytes. It can be mild, where we have like five or fewer spotty necrosis where uh, 10 high power field, or we call it moderate when there is five to 10 spotty necrosis where 10 high power field, and severe when there is more than 20 spotty necrosis where high 10 power field. So again, this is the algorithm for grading activity in chronic hepatitis as an example here to show you. So this is here the interface hepatitis, and this is the parenchymal uh, injury. And you see here where we have like a mild interface hepatitis with mild parenchymal injury is still mild, then it can be overall, it can be moderate or it can be severe as well. So this kind, you know, can be used as a, you know, a helpful uh, reference to just assess the overall all activity. Now, just very quickly about the morphological assessment of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And just to mention here that there are different, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, systems to deal with the morphological assessment of uh, fatty liver disease. It includes the Macioni or Brandt or Promrat or Kleiner in IHCRN or Mindler or FLIB uh, CF once. So these different schemes or systems for assessment of fatty liver disease were largely designed for clinical trials rather than diagnosis. Um, the, I mean, they consider them at not for routine application by non-specialists. Uh, and they incorporate a limited report, re repertoire of features and disc discriminant function uh, is limited with inherent idiosyncrasies. And these systems assume um, a pure diseases in one. However, this can be still utilized and some of the hepatologists, they will ask for it. I mean, they will ask to assess these fatty liver disease on one of these uh, schemes or systems for, for, for this purpose. Now, examining the hepatic veins, uh, we, uh, we need to see if there is any evidence of a flebosclerosis with narrowing of lumina in veno occlusive disease or occlusion by thrombus uh, or inflammation in the vein wall uh, like endotheliitis in, in severe hepatitis, very venular, um, uh, uh, perifilar and perisinusoidal fibrosis. So again, we need to examine the hepatic uh, veins. Sorry, I think we need to go back a little bit. So we need to look at the sinusoids in the immediate very venular zone to see if there is any sinusoidal dilatation and hepatocyte atrophy in a chronic venous outflow obstruction and evidence <clears throat> of necrosis and evidence of necrosis in very venular hepatocytes. So all of these kind of things, uh, you know, you need just to, to, I mean, to keep in mind to be looking in each of these, I know these are a lot, but with time, you will be having like your own checklist that you go over in, you know, very quickly in each of these liver biopsies. So then regular, uh, again, within the SNI, you need to say, you need to uh, see if there's any irregularities of the hepat hepatic plates, if there is any evidence of reticular collapse, regenerative activity or pseudoglandular formation, if there is any evidence of rosetting of hepatocytes in autoimmune hepatitis, for example, 
or cholestasis, cholestasis, or intracanalicular blogging of the, <clears throat> of the bile. Whether the bile is affecting the hepatocytes, we call it cholestasis, or whether there is this blogging of bile <clears throat> within the canaliculi or even within the uh, bile ducts in the, in themselves sometimes. Again, uh, we see if there is any sinusoidal dilatation because this might reflect some diseases, <clears throat> whether this is, might be drug induced or related to other etiologies or pathologies, and also the amount of the reticulin and the distribution. And again, the type of necrosis, uh, we should be looking for this, and we have already touched base on this one, whether there is a coagulative uh, necrosis in toxic injury, which is rare in hepatitis other than CMV and herpes virus. The distribution of the necrosis, whether this is generalized or specific to one of the zones, the extent of the necrosis, whether this is focal or confluent or pan -asinar. So this is the kind of the things that you look for in terms of necrosis. Now the hepatocyte degeneration, whether there is apoptosis, which we call it acidophil bodies in acute hepatitis and cholestasis, and whether there is a spotty necrosis that we just mentioned. Uh, also, you can look at the hepatocyte nuclei <clears throat> and to see the degree of bleomorphism and dysplasia. Uh, if there is any giant slip formation, extent by nuclear forms, vacuolation like cytoplasmic invagination in diabetes and steroids and others. Now, the acinar inflammation, you need, again, to look at the type of inflammation, whether these are lymphocytes and plasma cells in, hepatocyte, in hepatitis, polymorphs in steatohepatitis in NASH or ASH, whether this is alcoholic or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, as we said, <clears throat> isinophils in drug-related damage, or the presence or absence of, absence of granulomas. Now, the severity of inflammation must be assessed. It can be graded into mild to moderate to severe. And the distribution of inflammation, whether this is a random or zonal, and if there is any other associated hepatocyte necrosis with the inflammation itself. Now, the hepatocyte cytoplasm can show the, within the hepatocytes fatty changes, whether this microvesicular or macrovesicular steatosis, whether there is eosinophilic granules and the globules in zone one in alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, for example, or eosinophilic globules of mega, mega mitochondria in fatty liver disease, or mallory bodies, you know, in uh, which can uh, be in fatty liver disease in zone three <clears throat> or in zone one in cirrhosis which is due or related to biliary diseases. Again, these are the different you know, changes that we can see in hepatocytes. This is a balloonic degeneration. The hepatocytes uh, are swollen, as you see, and dimitous looking with ballooning. With some, we call it uh, ballooning degeneration or sometimes feathery degeneration. Here, the uh, acidophil bodies or the apoptosis, apoptotic hepatocytes, as you see here at the arrow. Here, the focal spot necrosis, and these are the mallory bodies. And, you know, the mallory bodies, which are the uh, uh, cytokeratin filaments, actually, as a result of the damage for the hepatocytes, it can be seen by HND, or you can do sometimes some uh, specific immuno stains like B62. And this is again, this is apiquitin, another stain which can highlight these mallory hyaline bodies in the, for example, in this case, in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So collate stasis, what, what do you mean by collate stasis? Sometimes it's meant to be the feathery degeneration or the xanthomatous change or the pseudo xanthomatous change that we see in the hepatocytes, which are adjacent to portal tracts. They appear as pale, foamy, or bubbly, and often bile stained. We call it collate stasis. And usually this is a sign of the chronic cholestasis. In chronic hepatitis B, for example, 
uh, we might see what's so-called the ground glass hepatocyte or appearance. And this can be recognized by HND. And also if, you know, do, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, some other stains, special stains, also these hepato ground glass appearance can be apparent in, in, in these immune stains. These are the alpha-1 antitrypsin globules, again, which can, you know, uh, uh, the PAS, the STs can be very helpful on this, but again, still we can do some immunohistochemistry also to illustrate this. Here, back to the chronic hepatitis B and ocean stain can be helpful to highlight these, uh, what look like ground glass appearance to stain the uh, hepatocyte, uh, the hepatitis antigens within the, these ones. Here, immunohistochemistry for hepatitis B virus core antigen. And this is again, more sort of solid, uh, strong positivity for the antigen within the hepatocytes, which can also be very helpful. This is uh, in a chronic hepatitis C. This is again, another stain, which is the ocean stain to highlight the copper associated proteins here to show that these proteins are increased okay in these contexts for example in either cholestasis or in uh, for example in this one in hepatitis c so in hepatocyte cytoplasm again you can see the different types of pigments this can be granular yellow brown you know pigment or pigment which you know uh, or lipofuscin pigment mainly in zone three, iron initially in zone one, copper associated proteins uh, in periportal, or the yellow green bile pigment, the darker the green pigment in Dobbin Johnson syndrome, or black granules in copper cells in infections such as malaria and schistosomiasis. So pigments here again, as we said, can be seen and you should sometimes just looking at a higher power to see if there is any kind of these pigments which can be obvious. Now here to show <clears throat> the difference between the lipofuscin pigment on the left side and the cholestasis on the right, which are found predominantly in zone three of the acinus. So the lipofuscin pigment, as you see here, is fine, well delineated, light brown and located particularly at the canalicular pole of the hepatocytes, as you see here. Whereas the intracellular bile in cholestasis here in the arrow has a greenish hue, is less granular, and often forms canalicular thrombi. So this is the difference you see here between the lipofuscin here and the, uh, uh, the bile, the uh, cholestasis or the intracellular bile uh, stasis here. Again, within the hepatocyte cytoplasm, sometimes you can find evidence for storage and metabolic materials like excess of glycogen, neutral lipid, foam cells, crystals like needle shaped in porphyria uh, cutana tarda. Come for cells now. If they are present there, so this means that there is some sort of, they are increased in number and becoming, you know, uh, very like, can, you know, uh, be seen easily, uh, readily seen on liver biopsies. If you see them, you need to see their number and distribution, uh, whether there is steroid laden, uh, you know, uh, pigment uh, macrophages or copper cells, which indicate an active, you know, uh, liver damage, if they have any iron accumulation or, or if they contain any perfringent foil material or contain crystals in cystinosis, or sometimes they become enlarged and bale staining in uh, some specific storage diseases. So copper cells also can be, can be uh, helpful and they might have some clues to the diagnosis. Sinusoids, as we mentioned, they become, they might become congested in some diseases. They might contain increased number of neutrophils in sepsis, for example, or even sometimes they might <clears throat> contain atypical or abnormal lymphocytes in leukemia and infectious mononucleosis or sickled 
red cells as we see have seen in the uh, initial slide, or they might contain megakaryocytes and hepato, uh, hematobiotic cells in extramedullary hematobiosis. Uh, uh, now, having established the basic patterns after we look all of these sort of things and cells and the clues and patterns of injury, after this, we need to correlate with the biochemical, serological changes and the clinical features. I do advise always to contact the treating physicians, the hepatologists, because you might get some surprises. You might get some more information, some more history about the patient, which might alter your differential diagnosis or even sometimes diagnosis. So it is always very beneficial to contact the physician you know, before like final, finalizing your, your, your diagnosis or differential diagnosis. The best scenario, the best, you know, setup is to do the final diagnosis after a proper a clinical pathological diagnosis at MDT meetings, the multidisciplinary meetings. So that's just a summary, you know, although it's a very thorough summary, but I think with the practice, it becomes much easier and easier to learn about these ones. So the recommended panel of specialist things, this is just very quickly, it's recommended to have like at least more than one level of HND, reticulin stain to assess the architecture, as we said, mason trichrome, vangison also for architecture and sometimes can be used for, you know, if there is any evidence of collapse, elastic vangison sometimes can be used to differentiate between collapse and fibrosis. Shikata or sheen to assist for uh, different purposes, but has to be virus, copper associated proteins and elastic fibers. PS to identify glycogen, small fossil necrosis, granulomas, fungi, chistosome ova. PS stain uh, plus the stays for mucin for alpha-1 antitrypsin disease globules and steroid laden macrophages, and also pairs stain for iron. So, so these are the kind of specialist things that you, you use for uh, uh, you know, complete evaluation and inter interpretation of liver biopsies. So again, this, this is just a table. Mason trichrome uh, usually stains the type one collagen and it's good for fibrosis, reticulin type three collagen. And it's, it's good to assist <coughs> necrosis and regeneration, uh, BASD, uh, for complex carbohydrates, non-glycogen, uh, uh, and then it's good to assess for uh, necrosis, lipofacin laden macrophages, bile duct injury, or alpha-1 antitrypsin globules, iron for hemicidrin, hemicidrosis, or hemochromatosis, brown, usually uh, iron looks like brown pigment, uh, rhodamine is again for cover associated proteins, Victoria Blue or Ocean, Shikata stain for hepatitis B, service antigen, copper binding protein, and for elastic uh, fibers as well. So for immunohistic chemistry, I think you can use different kinds uh, to help you sometimes. Uh, in, for example, in viruses, you can use some specific antibodies for hepatitis B service and core antigen, for delta antigen, for herbicide simplex, uh, also, you can use some immunohistochemistry uh, uh, markers for structural components like keratin, you know, monoclonal like uh, type 818 or type 718, uh, or factor 8, CD3431 uh, for endothelial cells or vascular tumors, B62 and apiquitin for malaria bodies. A smooth muscle actin is good to highlight the hepatic stellate cells in, in vitamin A, uh, A toxicity, for example, for metabolic products, alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, and alpha uh, feature protein uh, and CA are also can be utilized for different reasons for either deficiencies or for the carcinomas, uh, especially hepatocellular carcinoma. So immunohistochemistry for liver tumors can be used for primary tumors to confirm primary origin, liver cell or collagen carcinoma, and for metastatic tumors where you can suggest possible primary sites. So these are again a list of some useful antibodies 
that just mentioned. CD10 CD or bilclonal CA are really good, actually, uh, you know, uh, markers, uh, uh, especially in the context of uh, uh, hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Uh, again, you can use uh, the, the, the hepatocytes stain to confirm the origin of hepatocellular tumors, cytokeratin 19 or cytokeratin 7. You know, 19 is positive in collagio carcinomas and some liver uh, carcinomas and pancreas. Cytokeratin 7 is like 19, where also, and plus sustains stomach and breast. Cytokeratin 20 for cholerectal TTF1 for to exclude metastatic lung. You know, the 34 uh, B, uh, B12 for lung squamous high molecular keratins for lung squamous carcinoma. The WG1 promogranin, ER for breast ovaries, BSA, CD20, et cetera, et cetera. All of these can be utilized in general just to help you, you know, to confirm the origin of the tumors. These are just very quick uh, examples uh, for, you know, to show the utilization of the immunohistochemistry markers. This is a male uh, of 50 with hepatitis C positive, now who presented with a liver mass. And you can see here, there is a tumor, and this tumor is positive for the hepatocyte immunohistochemistry marker. So, so this is a, a primary origin. So uh, CD10 uh, highlighting this canalicular pattern. We, we, this is very typical in primary hepatic tumor, the canalicular pattern, which can be by biliclonal or CD10 markers. And the CK19 is negative and the alpha fetoprotein, I think it's focally uh, weak positive here, but so this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. This is just to show you the utilization of these immunomarkers. So this is a female, 50, enlarged growing lymph nodes. And CT scan showed a 2.5 centimeter liver lesion. So this is from the liver. And you see here that by just doing like the cytokeratin markers, say like AE, pan CK, and the CD20, you can see this is more or less, this is a diffuse non-Hodgkin lymphoma where the whole sort of bronchima has been damaged uh, and uh, by the lymphoid infiltrate, by the new plastic lymphoid infiltrate. Again, this is a female 85 with a liver mass with no known primary. So they did CK19, which is positive, and then CK20, which is negative. Then the uh, here, the CA199 is negative. And then the, sorry, CA199, sorry, CK20 is negative, 199 is positive. <clears throat> so this is a metastatic carcinoma of a query pancreatic or pancreatico biliary origin. This is another male 82 with past history of uh, squamous cell carcinoma and now presenting with a liver lesion with colorectal cancer and squamous cell carcinoma presenting with a liver mass. So CK20 is diffuse and strong positive. CK7 is negative. And so this is most likely is metastatic colorectal cancer. So next one is a female, 71 with right lung mass with multiple liver lesions. And you can see this is TTF1 negative, whereas the 34 beta 12 is positive, strongly positive, and this high molecular weight you know, uh, uh, cytokeratin marker. So this is metastatic lung squamous carcinoma. Again, this is a liver in the lung and pelvic masses. She's a female of 70. TTF1 is a strong positive. CD56 is positive. And CK7 is positive. So this is most the small cell anaplastic carcinoma, metastatic small cell carcinoma to the liver from the lungs. So of, of 
lung origin because this is TTF1 positive. So this is again the female 68 with the liver metastasis previously treated for breast and cecal cancers. So CK7 is positive and CK20 on the other hand is negative. So we did uh, a gross cystic uh, disease uh, fluid protein 15, which is one of the markers, you know, uh, used to be specific for, for now we have better, which is GATA1 for breast disease and it is focally positive and the ER is positive. So this is, and uh, the uh, BR is, is positive. So this is a metastatic uh, breast cancer, which is ER positive, BR positive and HER2 negative. So again, this is a female with 89 with a liver metastasis with pelvic mass involving the large bowel and ovary. And this is CK20 negative whereas WT1 is positive and CA125 focally positive and ER is positive and then the CK19 is positive, CK7 is negative. So this is uh, of ovarian origin. So this is mostly of, you know, um, metastatic tumor of ovarian origin. So in summary, here just, these were just few examples. And in summary, uh, well understanding of the liver histology, physiology, and biochemistry is essential for proper evaluation of biopsies. A systematic approach for liver biopsy interpretation is always encouraged. And with time, I think everybody will develop his own way of, or approach or checklist even for approaching these liver biopsies. Specialist things are needed and should be interpreted in the right context with awareness of their limitations. Establishing the predominant pattern of injury is the first step to consider the possible differential diagnosis. And there are different grading and staging systems for morphological assessment of liver diseases, including chronic hepatitis and fatty liver disease. Immunohistic chemistry stains are utilized in confirming or excluding primary and metastatic tumors. I think there'll be more and more to discuss about, you know, liver diseases and, you know, uh, uh, and liver tumors. But I think for the time limitation, we will, you know, um, you know, uh, probably uh, uh, this is would be the end of this lecture. So good luck. And this is a nice liver histologist smile, as you see here. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.